Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Hope you're as excited as I am for this check we're getting, this stimulus check. It's because the government cares. That's what's going on. They just care too much. You know, you can always tell somebody's motivation, you know, or this is for yourself and for your own self-awareness. Like, how can you decipher your own motivation? Like I always bring up, how can you tell whether you're avoiding pain or increasing pleasure? Oftentimes it feels exactly the same especially if we've been spending our entire life avoiding pain. We think it's increasing pleasure. Then my litmus test for this is always, do you think that drinking makes you happy? Is drinking pleasurable? That's the litmus test. If you think it's pleasurable, if you think that is pursuing pleasure, then your emotions are completely out of whack. Alcohol is a depressant. If it makes you feel better, it's because it's depressing your anxiety. You're not feeling your anxiety for the moment. And yeah, you feel good. Oh, this is good. Okay, well, that's just an indication that your your emotions are out of whack. You're out of touch with your emotions. You, You can't tell whether something feels not bad or good. And there's a big difference. And the motivation behind that uh, decision is huge. But often you can't tell the motivation until after. Like if somebody says, oh, I want to move to Brooklyn to become a sculptor. You go, okay, maybe you do. Maybe being a a sculptor is really something you want to do. And you're not just trying to be cool. You're not just trying to live out some fantasy. You're not simply trying to escape something. I don't know what it is. Your family, some emotional issue that you have. But then you go to Brooklyn, try to be a sculptor, and of course, that's probably not going to work out, and you're even more miserable than before. And then you think, well, well, maybe that wasn't the reason. Because if I really wanted to simply move to Brooklyn and become a sculptor, then even if it didn't work out, I would still be, you know, at least going in the right direction and find something else out about my life. Okay, that wasn't the right decision, but how about the next decision? Where does this lead me? But if you just go to Brooklyn and you're miserable and that, boy, sure gives you some indication of what's going on. And we often see this with Oedipal mothers, right? Oh, I'm, I'm not trying to protect you or, you know, keep you near me. I, I just want you to be safe. I just want you to be safe and comfortable. I'm looking out for your best interest. Okay, potential Oedipal mother. But now your kid's grown up and he's, it's time to, for him to go away to college. Oh, you don't want him to move f- too far away. Or he gets a job across the country. Oh, you don't want him to move too far away. Or, or yeah, even move out of the house. He got a great job. He, now he can leave his, the house and pay for the rent on, on his own. Oh, you don't want that. Oh, now you're uncomfortable. Okay, so maybe previously it wasn't about safety or, or comfortable or yeah, wanting your son or daughter to be comfortable or looking out for their best interest. It was about something else. And we can only see that after the fact. We can't really tell in the moment. We can only see that after the fact. And I think that's exactly what's going on with this government stimulus, this $2 trillion, I don't know, is it $6 trillion or $23 trillion in, tr- in debt? doesn't even matter anymore. But you go, okay, there's a government shutdown of, of the economy. Maybe they just care. Maybe they just really care about us. And now they're going to come and save us. So maybe they just really care. Okay, but what would this look like if the government simply cared about people? They don't. But what if, what would it look like if it did? They would take the $2 trillion or $6 trillion, whatever it's going to be, and they would just split it up equally among everybody. But that's not what they're doing, is it? So now we look back at the lockdown and go, oh, was this really about safety? And then we look at Singapore and South Korea and now Germany and a few other countries that are coming out where the uh, coronavirus did not affect them as much. They didn't do an, an economic uh, shutdown. And we begin to think, oh, maybe there are some ulterior motives here. You know, maybe the government now is acting like the Oedipal mother. Oh, we care about your safety. This is about saving lives. Don't go out. This is about saving lives. Is it about saving lives? And you can save lives in a bunch of different ways. Yeah, ban cars, save lives. Is that really about saving lives, though? And whenever I bring this up, you, you, you just because you, you can't mention this now. It's totally uncool to have this perspective. Of course, coronavirus is worse than the flu. Nobody's denying that. What I'm talking about is the reaction to what's going on. And now with the stimulus bill and, and what it all entails and a bunch of money to a bunch of different organizations that aren't even affected by the coronavirus, it's not even about that. It's just some power grab. Like the Oedipal mother, it's a power grab. You know, we talk about secondary emotional payoffs. The result of 
partaking in a maladaptive neurotic loop. In a loop that takes you ever more you know, away from reality. I mean, there's got to be some payoff from it. Right? Like I always say about the, the heroin addict b- banging. Yeah, right. It's not, not a heroin addict. Let's just say somebody banging on the door of somebody's apartment building at 3.34 in the morning. Like, this doesn't make any sense. Don't they have to get up for work? You know, don't they have family and friends that they care about? And then you find out they're a heroin addict. You, you know, you just put that variable in there and it's, oh, okay. Now it makes sense. And you think you're that much different than a heroin addict. You are definitely not. It's just a different kind of heroin and one kind of heroin, some kind of analgesic, something that removes us from the pain, not increasing pleasure, decreasing pain. Power is a great one. Power is a powerful payoff. It is a powerful drug. Victimhood is powerful. Self-pity is powerful. Shame can be powerful. Toxic shame now. I guess that's different from regular shame. Uh, You know, that helplessness kind of isolation. You know, that is a powerful analgesic. And it just, yeah, removes us from the pain. And power is one of those too. Uh, You know, not just government power, but, but personal power. Trying to exert your will over somebody else. Oh no, I'm not trying to exert my will. Over, I'm will over you. I just care. I just want the best for you. I want you to be as comfortable as possible. What happens when being as comfortable as possible isn't the best thing? Right. I mean, what happens then? Then your true motives are exposed, and I think the true motives, you know, you know, whatever. Uh, good motives we put behind this lockdown. You know, I get it. We are afraid. And there's a reason to be afraid. The coronavirus, worse than the flu. I'm not saying we don't, we shouldn't take some measures, but when it comes to a complete government shutdown, this is looking more and more silly. And my original point from two weeks ago, that this is a total overreaction, is I think slowly being vindicated. Um, but... Like I would say to, to anybody who has an Oedipal mother, who's the real Oedipal one, right? Who's the one who wants the, the mom to come and, and rescue and, and save them and say, oh, you don't want to take that job across the country. Oh, they're not really paying enough. Oh, do they give good benefits? Oh, they're, they're not giving the best benefits. Oh, you better just stay home. I don't know what she's doing. She's just, uh, the, the Achilles is healing. Let's take a, a razor blade and slowly saw a little bit at the razor blade, but the crazy thing about that is the Oedipal son, the Oedipal daughter likes it too. They are complicit in it. And what's the reason, right? It's the the same reason behind the the true not, the vampires, the psychic vampires in Dr. Sleep that we were talking about a couple weeks ago. It is fear that you are avoiding. When you are avoiding fear, when you're avoiding some core thing about you, and it may not be a concrete thing, Maybe it's simply fear of independence, fear of what it's like to make a decision on your own and mess up and then learn from it, fear of going through that process. Then when the Oedipal mother comes and saws away a little at your Achilles, you go, oh, good. Oh, good. I didn't really want to go. Like, I guess I was going to go. I didn't really want to, but my mom kind of came at me with that. "Uh, But what what about the family? Uh. I care about you. Okay, good. Now I'm going to shut down. And this is what's happening on a societal level. Uh, Strange, though. You know, this is definitely an interesting time. I've Nobody alive has ever been a part of anything like this. I mean, I think even the Spanish flu wasn't really like this because in the Spanish, during the Spanish flu, it was like 1918, 1920, you know, the world was not as as interconnected uh, like we are today. But like every hero's journey, every dark night of the soul, that, that place at the end of the second act in a three act movie, third act and a f- four act movie. I don't know why I have to keep distinguishing between that, but there, that place where the, the hero just gets to the point where all is lost dark night of the soul. Like everything that I thought, everything that I working was working towards, it was just completely ripped out from under me. Well, what's the point of that? What's the hero supposed to learn? The hero is supposed to learn how to build their psychology so the next time it happens, they're not as affected by that. So if you go through a divorce or huge financial loss or 
I don't know, like somebody dies and it really, like your dad dies and it really affects you, you can go, okay, the next time this happens, how do I need to build up my life, you know, uh, psychologically, financially, uh, emotionally, you know, relationship-wise, spiritually, materialistically, what things do I need, both, both existential and psychological, to get me through this the next time? You know, if your girlfriend breaks up with you and it's just like downward spiral for six months, it's like, oh, I was using her for validation. Okay, so what do I need? Do I need that girlfriend? No, but I need to build up a sense of my own validation. I need to learn how to get my own needs met. I need to learn how to, to pay attention to my psyche, to what I want to say, to my anger. I need to get good with that. I need to build up that muscle. Yeah, same thing if you're going through some some kind of sports injury. I, I injured uh, my shoulder in high school, and I think in college too. Okay, what what, was, what did I do? Right, I, I went in, and I strengthened my shoulders. I did exercise to strengthen rehab my shoulders. Now, what do I do when I go to the freaking gym? I can't go to the gym now. I mean, even the gym at at our, in our apartment complex is closed. You know, what do I <laughs> what do I do? I'm doing my rotator cuff exercises. So, you know, it's the same thing. I had an injury in high school because of uh, basically inflex. I could barely touch my toes. I'm pretty flexible now. You know, it's just like, okay, I'm going through this crisis. What what am I going to need in the future? What is this showing me about me? And I think this, you know, this coronavirus, any kind of crisis, but I think the coronavirus is uh, especially important because we're all going through the same thing. I mean, to varying degrees. Um, if you work in like some kind of hospitality restaurant business, it's obviously way worse. Uh, but I think anything good that can come out of this, right? We're always trying to look for the silver lining. Anything good that can come out of this, it's okay, what do we need? What do we all need? Not collectively, but what does each one of us need? And if this is going to be a um, a community kind of collective, spiritually enriching, sunder kind of experience. It's going to be, okay, now everybody in America is looking in on themselves. Right? We freaked out. We freaked out. Lockdown is fine. We're not going to do anything about it. This government stimulus is going to pass. We're not going to do anything about it. What do we need to do? I would say collectively, boy, we have some attachment issues that we need to get figured out. And if we don't get these figured out, then we're going to unconsciously create this ever more increasing edible relationship with some kind of state power. Like we were talking about a couple weeks ago on the undiscovered self, the greatest political treaties of all time barely talks about politics. It's talking about you and your relationship with yourself. That's what matters the most. All right. Got a few questions here. We have five. Uh, yeah, let's get to all of them. This one is about cognitive behavioral therapy and tapping. Emotional freedom technique. I know I've talked about this before, but it's worth talking about again. A lot of people are really getting into this now. It's been happening. I mean, it's been on my radar for maybe the past 15 years, but yeah, people really like it. And I mean, this guy was essentially making fun of it uh, and saying I should ridicule tapping. I'm not going to. I'm not going to uh, ridicule emotional freedom technique because I think it is effective not for the reasons that they that they say. So essentially what it is, is you, is you think about a negative experience. So let's say you focus on your anxiety. Um, now people will typically get into it to using it for certain scenarios. Okay, so you have a family gathering coming up and you have issues with some family members. Maybe, maybe some things are left unsaid. Maybe there's some unprocessed trauma there that's just beneath conscious awareness and it's just going to make uh, conversations stiff. You know, we've all been in those conversations when you're both trying to avoid the same issue. Oh, we can't really talk about it, but let's pretend things are going well. Okay, this is a tense, anxiety-inducing experience, so what do you do? Now, according to tapping, you would uh, tap on, like, your chakra node centers as you're going through the anxiety that you think you're going to experience in, in uh, like, this family reunion, this family gathering. Would it help if I, yeah, maybe, maybe it helps if I pull the table in a little bit. Here, does that sound better? So what essentially you're doing is you're tapping on certain parts of your body as you're visualizing an aspect, in one respect, as you are imagining the emotion that you're going to go through. 
but what are you really i'm so yeah so the explanation is oh you're talking you're tapping on your chakra node centers and this releases the energy really what's going on is you are allowing yourself to sit with your emotions and it's a strange thing for you you've never sat with your emotions before so you have to come up with like some uh, strange eastern indian chakra uh, explanation for why you would want to sit with your emotions because th there's no other explanation for it so you know in a roundabout way you're just becoming more comfortable with your emotions that's why this works now it does lessen the intensity of your anxiety i think there's plenty of evidence to show that but it's just because you're you're sitting with your emotions you know you're just becoming more comfortable with them you're allowing yourself to become acclimated with them and it works just as well and i, I know it's not not about tapping on the chakra centers it works just as well when you do the same tapping on a doll so it's clearly just about you sitting with your emotions. Yeah, it's like a, a visualization for your emotions. It's a way to emotionally visualize. And it's something I even talk about in my book, Man's Guide to Psychology. I didn't talk about tapping. Now, look, if you want to use tapping to become more emotionally comfortable, great. Then do it. But another issue with tapping is, well, I don't know if, if it's really employed in this way, but people will you know, just treat it like, oh, this is the end. Okay, I did my tapping. I've cleared out my chakra, my chakras, and I've cleared out my energy channels. Now I'm going to be more comfortable in the family gathering. Well, no. Now, maybe that made it more likely for you to be more comfortable in the family gathering. That's great. But for what purpose, right? To really confront the issue for what it is. If there is something left unsaid between you and your cousin, it's your job to become, to, to develop enough emotional fortitude so you can go and have any kind of difficult conversation that you need to have. Maybe you, you were fighting over a will five years ago and you never really resolved that dispute, whatever it is. Okay, you have to go apologize. You have to go explain your side or, you know, whatever it is. Maybe, maybe you don't owe him a, an apology. I don't know. Right, but it's about confronting the issue. So you can use tapping to become more comfortable with your emotions so you're more likely to manage the issue you still got to manage the issue and what, what i see what i see with a lot of tapping is people going oh now i feel better because i sat with my anxiety yeah you feel better now what what's the next thing we improve our psychology to relate with reality in a better way and we relate with reality in a better way a more helpful productive way so we can improve our psychology it's just this feedback mechanism and if it just stops with oh i feel better which, which a lot of psychology is now, and it's not just Eastern mysticism, this is kind of behavioral therapy, influenced by stoicism, which, of course, if you go back to my uh, stoicism podcast from a few weeks ago, the first piece of, um, yeah, the, the, excuse me, the first piece of Western thought to be influenced by Eastern thought was stoicism. And we can see the definite relationship here with Oh, I, I feel better. So now I, I don't have to talk to my cousin about that uncomfortable issue. No, you feel better. And now you go talk. You make it more likely to bring that up and other things up in a more helpful way without freaking out about it. Do it in a way that actually makes your cousin feel better. That's the challenge. But that comes from emotional regulation, from emotional acceptance, from emo emotional acclimation. So if you need a little bit of a help with that, then tapping can be useful. Um, next question, is there such thing as evil or do people just have psychological issues? So I guess we could go back to the Oedipal mother. Is she evil because she wants to limit her son or daughter, uh, wants to limit their emotional psychological development so she can feel better? Um, well, you know, it depends on the context. From a philosophical perspective, yeah, I guess you could call that evil. Psychologically, no, nothing's evil. Psychologically, yeah, it always comes down to your emotional issues. If Hitler didn't have emotional issues, would he have been Hitler? No. There there were a bunch of things going on there. I'm not going to spend time psychoanalyzing Hitler, but if he really managed those issues, then he wouldn't want to at least get rid of a certain segment of the population. And, and this is true for everybody. And this is especially true when you come into therapy and you know, you're going to be looking at parts of yourself that you don't like. And it's typical for people, especially when they come from this, oh, good, evil, philosophical, maybe more religious, maybe more, I would even call it Western philosophy, philosophical perspective. Oh, well, if I admit these bad things about myself, if I admit the, these things I did wrong, then I'm a bad person. 
Well, psychologically, no, you're not. And you think I'm like being a little bit smarmy here trying to wriggle out of the issue. No, but it's very important. Philosophically, yeah, you did something bad. Join the club. It's it's the everybody club. But psychologically, you got to understand where you're coming from. And probably if you did something bad, you're in a lot of pain. In pain you weren't aware of. So if you don't want to do something bad in the future, it's not about, oh, I'm going to choose not to do something bad, right? That's the that's CBT fantasy. CBT mindset training lecture real fantasy. No, it's about, well, understanding why you would do something bad in the future. Understanding the issue behind it. So you can stop it before even stop, yeah, before it starts and builds up into this huge pain that you're going to want to avoid. Uh, so yeah, uh, psychologically, no, there's no such thing as a bad person. I, I don't, w- whatever, Hitler is not bad from a psychological perspective. Stalin, Mao, whatever. I mean, these guys are clearly, I'm actually reading a a, a book on Chinese history. The last 400 years of Chinese history is called Sur- uh, a search for Mo- The Search for Modern China, excuse me. And yeah, it's like, why did the Chinese freaking kill 50 million people in the 20th century? Well, let's go back to 1600s at the fall of the Ming Dynasty, rise of the Qing Dynasty. That's where it begins. And it makes sense from a historical perspective why 50 million people would die in these planned starvation movements in the 20th century. You're, you're starting to see it. And if we do the same thing with Chinese history, you do the same thing with your life. Not to excuse it or explain it away or so that the next time you do it, you now have an excuse, but it's to really understand and regulate that emotion. So the next choice you make is much more likely to be more productive. Next question. Yeah, so there's this like viral kind of video of this girl talking about how simping is good and how guys should simp. So simping is uh, what I am, according to MGTOW, because I think creating relationships with women is a, is a good idea. But I think it also means like, you know, just, you know, your typical guy who's gets a girlfriend and then does whatever he can to make her happy and essentially puts her first. Like you take the driver's seat. So is simping good? And this guy's learning. He says, I could see how she's right, but for the wrong reasons. And I was wondering what your thoughts on this were. Yeah, I saw this video. It was all over Twitter maybe a week or so ago. And, you know, I don't know what her intentions are. (laughs) What, the, what this girl's intentions are. But yeah, I do think it is helpful to simp in a certain context. It's all about context. You do put a woman first in certain situations. This is what romance is. All romance is, is putting a woman first for a change. Now, what if you're some loser idiot who doesn't have a boundary, doesn't have his life together, And then you are infatuated with the girl. There's nothing really romantic there. And you want to start romance by getting romantic with her. That's not romance. That's weirdness. Romance is you're putting her first. And the implication is she's usually not. But you take time, you know, just like therapy with your emotions. Do your emotions come first? Well, philosophically, yeah, when you really start to understand emotions for what they are, they come first. And you begin to make emotional decisions, well-regulated emotional decisions. This is a nuanced point that I understand not a lot of people get. But let's just, from the typical perspective, therapy is you take time to put your emotions first. Because what happens if you don't? They freak out on you. If you just repress your emotions, they're going to freak out on you and you're going to start to make some dysregulated decisions. Oh, I'm, I'm going to move to Brooklyn uh, to be a sculptor. Well, no, it's because you've been avoiding this pain for the last seven and a half years. And now you don't know what to do besides just try to move away from it. But of course, wherever you go, there you are. Great saying. I love that saying. And that's how romance is. And that, that, that's what's how simping. And if I'm going to be charitable with, with, with what this girl's talking about, I didn't watch the entire podcast. I just saw that clip that everybody else saw. And yes, Simping can be helpful. Um, it's just taking time. It's just romance. But it's all in the context. A, a guy with a strong boundary can simp really hard and it doesn't matter. A guy with a weak boundary has to be more careful, has to pay more attention to his thoughts and his behaviors, has to you know play chess more with other people because he can't trust himself because he doesn't know who he is. And that's fine to do you know, uh, for a certain period of time. Especially when if you're young, you're in your 20s, you're still you know working on this stuff. 
but eventually you get to the point where it doesn't even matter like like simping is not even a word that you care about because you're so developed psychologically and you you really looked at your issues and you saw them for what they are and maybe you've seen yourself as a bad person you know maybe you had that you know that dark night of the soul looking at yourself man what am i really doing with my life um and you develop an identity from that. And then from a strong identity, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Now, you still don't put a woman first. You don't put anybody else first. But that realization, I mean, I can tell you that. I know it, that this doesn't matter. When, when I tell you not to put a woman first, it, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, there was a time when I thought, oh, maybe that would be helpful for, for guys. So it, it's not. You got to work on your psychology. You got to manage these boundary issues. And if you don't, then it's not like you're going to choose to put a woman first. That's what's going to naturally happen. Not because you're bad, right? I mean, if you don't manage your own issues, eventually you get to the point where you're like Hitler. Now, you're not going to be Hitler because you don't have the organizational leadership skills that Hitler had, but you're going to start thinking, okay, you know, this group of people, we just need to start uh, begin exterminating them or, boy, everything would be a lot better without this group of people. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to communicate with them. We just need to get rid of this group of people. I mean, you start having genocidal fantasies that, you know, we all have to some degree, right? Right? But it's not about that, right? It's just about your issue and not looking at it. And if, you know, if, if any of this thing seems abstract or vague, animusempire.com slash ebooks, Man's Guide to Psychology, I explain exactly how your emotions work there. When I'm talking about pain here, I would d- d- discuss exactly what that means. I don't need to get into that now. Um, yeah. It's all about context. Same thing with emotional expression. Um, I often bring up the example of, you know, the, the, uh, the patriarch. At a funeral, the guy who just has this this calm, emotional steadiness. When he cries, that's when everybody starts crying. You know, like the, the bubbies who, who cry you know, three times a day. Yeah, they're crying, but they're always crying. So what? It's when the guy who you know has his issues handled. Like maybe he's done something with his life that you respect. Maybe he's built a business. You know, he's got a family who he cares about. He has this great relationship with his wife or... X, Y, you know, whatever it is. And then, you know, when he gets emotional, that's when people get emotional. That's when simping, as we call it now, that's when simping is really powerful. And romance is really powerful. And therapy is really powerful. Next question. Thank you for this next question, by the way, because this is SEO Goldmine. Uh, Would narcissism be related with an incest fantasy? This guy recognizes some narcissistic tendencies in the way I talk about it. Yeah, he talks, he mentions, well, I don't have it written here. I didn't copy the whole email, but he did mentions how he has some like um, delusions of grandeur, I guess. And he thought it was, oh, I just think I'm better than everybody. Really what it is, it's you don't have a boundary, like we're just talking about. You don't have an identity. You haven't managed your issues. So you need to, in a sense, project out the opposite. Now, a bunch of uh, simp, psychologists would look at that and go, oh, look, narcissism means you have an inflated view of yourself. No, no, that's not what's going on at all. You, in fact, have no view of yourself. Oh, look, he's always trying to attract attention. He must really love himself. No, he needs attention from other people because attention from himself doesn't matter because he has no identity. Like attention from yourself, why would that matter? Like a narcissist, it wouldn't even register. But I don't, I mean, we're all narcissists to some degree. BPD being an exaggerated version of narcissism. And this guy has a uh, incest. Well, I don't know if he was, hasn't, I mean, I mean, I guess it would be an incest fantasy if you're watching incest porn. And uh, anyways, ever since this realization, he stopped watching incest porn. And he's wondering if, if this is related. Oh no. Yeah. I'm sorry. He stopped watching the incest porn because I was talking about it. Like, look, it just means that you have a difficult time taking your libido, as Jung would say, your libido, your psychic energy, and placing it out in the world. Now, yeah, Jung does talk about libido, not in the same context as Freud does. He thought it was a different function, came from a different place. Jung didn't think it was entirely sexual. I think it was partly sexual. Freud thought it was completely sexual. But Jung's explanation of the incest fantasy, which he talks about, 
volume five up there, Symbols of Transformation, it's it's essentially a failure to take your libido and use it in the world in a, in a productive way. What I would call confronting your anxiety in a helpful way, asserting your anger. You know, when the you go to the family gathering and you have those issues with your cousin, you just don't bring them up. The more you do that, the more likely you are to have an incest fantasy. And this listener's realization of this, you just stop watching incest porn. I guess it's been like a couple of weeks. Yeah, so this was a response when I was talking about it last time. So are these two issues related, especially with the narcissism? Yeah, um, it's related for exactly what I've been talking about in the previous two questions, right? Boundary. I mean, this comes down to your boundary. So if you firm up your boundary in one area, then you're more likely to firm it up in another area. And if incest, if we have incest fantasies because we don't have a strong enough boundary, we don't have a strong enough presence, not enough resilience in the world, then if you firm up that boundary with a realization of, oh, this is where my incest fan- my incest fantasy comes from. Oh, now I'm starting to see how I could be a narcissist and not just think I'm better than everybody. But yeah, well, that my narcissism stems from a in truth, a lack of self-worth. I mean, that understanding that is a part of affirming up the boundary. And I think if you just read Man's Guide to Psychology, you're going to become more mature because you start to see issues for what they really are. You know, you're not deluding yourself with thinking that narcissism is about uh, thinking you're better than everybody else. So yeah, I think that can be really helpful. And I'm sure that's why. And, yeah, and even re- like simple realizations. Like I'm guessing what happened with you in the incest porn is probably one of the reasons. I mean, it's like sick to watch, right? Like, oh, this is sick. Why do I keep watching this? And then you feel like you're sick. Like there's something wrong with you. So they're, now there's shame associated around it. And this goes back to the payoff. This builds up in the payoff. You feel shame from watching it. The shame cause, wants you to, to watch it more. But then if you just stop it, right? If Go back to the, the question two questions ago. If you just split apart the the um, philosophy and the psychology and go, oh, maybe I'm just, I'm not a bad person or I'm not some sick pervert for having this incest or watching incest porn, maybe having some kind of incest fantasy, maybe this is a result of how I relate with myself, then it kind of loosens up the shame. And since the shame is what drove you to watch the incest porn in the first place, yeah, it would make sense that you would be more likely to stop. Now, I don't think it's going to end here. You need to take those issues and really manage them. Really look at the issues that you're not uh, confronting properly, and, and you need to confront those. Otherwise, you know, this adrenaline shot, right, the, the stimulus check that you got from understanding just where narcissism and shame and incest fantasy comes from, it's going to dissipate, and you're not really going to be doing the, the real things that you need to do to um, strengthen your individual psychological economy. And, you know, it's just going to be this adrenaline shot that, yeah, it feels good and it's going to work in the short term, but you're also going to get burned out. Like, I I just saw that Ford versus Ferrari movie. Those guys doing the 24-hour Le Mans, and you think, wouldn't you sleep during it? Like, if you weren't driving, like, they have, like, three or four drivers, wouldn't you sleep? It's like, no, the adrenaline's going too, too hard. I wonder how much those guys slept afterwards, though. And they make a good point in the movie. Like, yeah, you think I just wake up at the beginning of the, the race? I know I'm up for 11, 12 hours beforehand. So I'm at least up for 36, 40 hours. And I'm sure you're alert and ready to go because of all the adrenaline and how good that must feel, but you're going to crash. And it's good that you're becoming aware of your narcissistic issues and anxiety that you could be avoiding that car- causes the narcissism, the boundary holes, and the incest porn watching or the incest fantasy, it's all related. But unless you really start managing those issues and getting very specific about what you need to do, it's all going to collapse. And I'm going to leave it there. We have one more question. I, I'm just not sure that my my iPhone can take all this uh, memory usage. I'm having some issues with it. So I'm going to end it there. Thank you guys for watching. We got this question. We'll get to it next time. If you have any more questions, animus at animus empire dot com um if you guys just need to reach out let me know what's going on especially now if you're in uh, your shelter at home you're in your lockdown if you have some issue that you want to talk about let me know and if you think i may be able to help animusempire.com slash schedule free 30 minute consultations if you're not sure what to do or where to go 
at least reach out to me. Have somebody to talk to. We talk through some issues that you could be going through, how I could possibly help, or some better options that would be good for you. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching or listening. Animus at AnimusEmpire.com, and I wish you all the joy and pain that comes from being in touch with reality.